So many people think that you have to season a freestyle disc. Mm -hmm. Well, let me, let me show you something. I'll show you my seasoned disc because I've never worn fake nails. And this has been the one that I've practiced on. Uh-huh. And it's like mangled. That's the one? All right. Yeah. You want, you want to stick it up? So you like having the, the, the cuts on the bottom of it? 100%. Oh. Equipment in Frisbee and disc golf is so fascinating because we like when things get old and worn and beat up. And there's like this personal bond with each disc. I don't feel like in golf that, it might be a thing in golf, but it feels like we like when these things stop functioning as designed. So this has got a little delamination on the top, which might affect a UD. No, I can't feel it. So yeah, this one feels better to me than. Okay, perfect. Rip it at me, let's see it. Oh my God, that's like stuff that I just like still can't even fathom. Oh. Wow. How much, like how much time did you put in right when you got the bug and you were transitioning away from disc golf? I promised myself an hour a day, which doesn't seem like a lot, but I was a full-time programmer at the time. Were you really? <laughs> yeah. So I, I was able to nail delay back in 2000-ish. Yeah. Oh, I have a funny story about that. I had just won, I think, my third world title, and I went back to Des Moines and I spotted for an amateur event and I was trying to learn to nail delay and so I was you know well it wasn't wasn't that good it was I could maybe get a second but I couldn't really I mean even doing this was hard, was and, hard. and this was impossible hit you yeah. in the face yeah so I'm on this long hole and I'm trying to do this nail delay between groups and I didn't see one group coming up, so they see me struggling with the disc. And the guys play through, and one guy just asked if I played disc golf as well. I said, yeah, I do. And he said, well, keep up with it, and maybe one day you'll get to play a tournament too. And that was after three world titles? <laughs> I, like a, a week after my third world title. Did you take that with grace, or was it kind of like a Oh, I, I thanked him, let him go by, and then laughed hysterically. What a good attitude to have. No, no, no. <laughs> That was, that was more comfortable than me, to yeah. me, than being yeah. recognized. Oh, dang it. You like that better than being recognized? I do, I do. Really? Yes. So being popular in disc golf is hard. If disc golf was this big when I started, yeah. I probably would have tried to climb to the top, Yeah. and then I would have run away right away. You think so? I know so. Oh, sick. What is that called? Bad Attitude. Okay. The names in, in freestyle are hilarious. Who, who comes up with them? Like, If you invent it, you get the honor of naming it. How radically different was it when you finally immersed yourself in freestyle coming from all those world titles that you had? The most bizarre thing. So my, my disc golf world titles you know, that was back in the marathon days where you would play nine, a semi, and a final. And a world title in freestyle, you have to make it through the semis with the women's divisions. They're so small that it's just directly to the semis. And then you got three minutes. Your world title is contested in three minutes. Is that terrifying? Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> it was terrifying and it was just bizarre because it's so different. The transitions to another person are so hard. What is like your favorite move? Like if you were to solo combo, like what do you what do you take to? I really like doing um, just like twister flex. What is that? It takes a lot of spin. Want to give it back to me after I send yeah. it to you? 
Whoa, hole in the ground. Oh, okay. Whoa. So it's, so it's underneath the front leg. And then it's behind the back. And wow, that's back so under hard. the leg again. Yeah, not many people can do it. It's more flexibility than skill. Wow, that's so crazy. <laughs> I'm sure at some point disc golf, like when you're winning that much, has to feel like monotonous at some point, right? So freestyle must have felt like such a joy. I started documenting the journey right away for kind of weird reasons. I had a lot of people throughout my disc golf career say things like, oh, you know, it must come so easy to you. And like, no, I worked really, really hard to get here. And so I partially started showing my freestyle stuff early when I was terrible because I wanted them to see the growth. Would you call yourself an artist? Like, would you call yourself an artistic person? <laughs> I don't know. I, uh, I just find it funny because you're like a programmer and it seems like your brain really likes like numbers and data. Well, I, I love creating things. You know, I, I knit, I sew, I quilt. I, I like to deconstruct stuff and do it myself. And I guess I, you could say that I've done that with freestyle. A couple more. Ah, oh, there we go. That was from Arthur Coddington. He told me I needed to be more creative. Arthur Coddington is one of my favorite people to play with. Really? James is really good about this too, but they make it so that you succeed. Yeah. That was fun. Thank you. I have a, a surprise for you. I have a, it, it helps me to transition into what we should probably talk about next, which is disc golf, because we're at the Winthrop Coliseum right now. Innova gave me a present. I know the show's called Catch. This is a four-time JK Valkyrie stamped Makani, which is, for those of you watching, <laughs> is a catch disc. But this stamp, can you talk about this real quick? Well, uh, so I was the first woman to ever have an actual signature series disc. And and it was it was the Valkyrie. I mean they made the AVRX for me when I started with Innova, so that was a little bit different, but the Valkyrie was in honor of my successes and I was the first woman to have that. And so this is, yeah, I, I have a handful of these, not on a Macan, not yeah. on this. Um, and I refuse to throw them because I want proof at some point in the future that they actually existed. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, this was a gift from Innova to you. Um, and they, they said, we want to let JK shine. So we want you to freestyle, but we also want you to remember the history of where you came in disc golf too. And I also want to tell you about this disc. This is not a, a Zephyr, but it's very close to mm -hmm. a Zephyr mold. And Zephyrs are what I use in accuracy, which was one of my favorite overall events. Really? Yeah. You want to toss that right now? Yes. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> when I initially gave them my signature, Dunapace complained that it wasn't quite pretty enough. Your signature wasn't pretty enough? It's my signature. I can't do any better. <laughs> Did you practice it a lot when you first got the gig? No. <laughs> you just laid it down on paper? Yeah, I don't remember. I just remember him uh, berating me slightly for not so, having a prettier signature. I interviewed Ken Climo last night for like an hour, hour and a half, and the most interesting thing that I gained from him was out of all the stories you hear, how confident he was, how cutthroat he was, when I asked him about getting his Tour Series disc for the first time, he was so bashful about it. Really? He said, he said it felt weird. He said he felt maybe a little imposter syndrome, like he didn't feel like he deserved it. Did, did, like, does that surprise you? Yes, that blows me away. There. There's not a single person playing back then that would have said that he didn't deserve it. But there were a lot of people that wished that they could also have such an honor because well, he was it for the longest time. Like, how, how did you feel about it? Did you feel a similar way or were you really excited about getting that tour series for the first time? Uh, gosh, I feel like, I feel like I say, oh, I didn't deserve it, but no, I was, I, it was such an honor. I was so proud to be on a disc and I was so proud to be a woman and be on a disc. However, at that time, men thought it was a woman's, a woman's disc because a woman's name was on it. 
yes, a Valkyrie is a woman. <laughs> they didn't know that or didn't care about that. But um, so yeah, there, there was talk that it might actually have decreased the popularity of the disc. Decreased? Because men didn't want to throw a women's disc. That just shows you how dominated by men it was back in the 90s. Yeah, and you know, I don't know if there's any truth to that, but some people use that as a reason why it shouldn't happen. Well, what's funny is I feel like a lot more people should have thrown Valkyries back then. It's a phenomenal <laughs> it a driver. It's a disc. When, do you have knowledge of like the year that the disc came out, like the Valkyrie? They put my name on it in 2000, I think. But I don't remember if it was out before that or not. Yeah, I was like, I was shocked because like signature discs were just like not a thing back then. So no. I, was, I was shocked that. It was a brand new idea. Like when you were playing for the first time, did you ever dream of something like that happening no. for you? Didn't know that it was something that I could dream of. I guess that I guess that's probably it. Because you talk to the players now, and it's 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 all like business. As you always hear like the talks of business, what's coming next, what the next year is gonna bring. But it's literally because. Yeah, for me it was it was an education. You know, I grew up in a very tiny town, and I did not have any street smarts, <laughs> and this was a good way to sort of. Uh, see the world, or at least see the states. I asked Ken the same question, but how how many years were you full full time in disc golf? Were you ever? Yeah, yeah. After I got my master's degree, um, I taught a tiny bit, and then went out on the road. So probably three full time years. How how was it? It was everything you can imagine. It was awesome, and it was. Awful. <laughs> you know, I lived in a van. The vans were not like they are today. Well, okay, what the heck? We'll get into it. Um, I was married very early because I was scared of the world. <laughs> Small town, not worldly. Um, and my husband at the time and I, sweet, we actually, we actually got an RV. And so we're touring around in the RV and um, kind of knew that this was either going to make us or break us. And it was the latter. <laughs> and so when finally said, okay, this is not working. Um, I'm going to stay on the road. I don't care what, what you plan to do. He took the RV. <laughs> oh. So I was left on the road with a little truck. <clears throat> and then the next year I ended up with Innova's help getting a van, but the vans were not tall. They were not insulated. It They're was, not comfy. It, it was loud. It was dirty. I couldn't, I couldn't stand up. It was not luxurious. It was not electrical. It was no, no water. <laughs> like, it's so funny because like, yeah, like van living is so romanticized, I feel like, but everything has a counterbalance. You know, what, what were the good sides for you of, of having the van and being out there on the road by Freedom. yourself? It, I was free. I could do whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted. And most tournaments were two day tournaments, so there was a lot more time in between. Oh yes, I got it, there we go. <laughs> That's my favorite catch, like all time favorite catch. Very pretty. What about you? What's your favorite catch? Well, I can't do it, but <laughs> the guidance is my favorite. Oh, okay. I don't, I, I have had a lot of broken arms in my past. And so I'm scared to jump and do anything where I'm, cause I don't roll, I just do this and then they snap and I don't want to snap anymore. So I understand. <laughs> we have so many COVID players that have never even played catch. Like it's crazy. I've done lessons and they, the players have said, nope, I just got into disc golf and that's it. Can you give us the guidance catch for dummies tutorial? I'm five years old. How do, how do I do a guidance catch? Okay, so the wind, you always face the wind when you're playing freestyle. So if the wind is coming from this direction and the disc is going, typically the disc is going up into the wind and it's going to come back and it's going to come back 
on your left side and you're gonna take a couple of steps. You're gonna jump into it with this big, beautiful, graceful leap and you're gonna catch, like the, the, the prettiest ones are where you do a switch kick. So you'll, you'll kick with the right and then in the air you'll switch so that the left and is in front. And you reach over the and back then, leg. Then you reach, so it's opposite arm, opposite leg, catch right here and then you roll out. You have to roll out. No, you don't have to, but, but the way that the people do it where it's most dynamic, you know, there's, it just happens. Do you, have you landed those? No, no, I've never tried one. Okay, good. And I never will. <laughs> <laughs> that was the thing about freestyle that was fascinating to me was like the description of someone being a power player versus like a finesse player. Yeah. Made, it was like, it made no sense initially. And then I was like, oh yeah, that makes total sense. So the only way that I can do a guidance is we did it in the um, in our little jam. Is I can pull here, I can set myself there, and then I can leap. And it's just, I mean, it's technically it's still the guidus um, under the umbrella of a guidus, but yeah. it, you know, it's more like a guidus, not a guidus. <laughs> I I, I want to hear. I mean, we've talked about this in the past, but I'd love to hear as we toss your four-time J.K. McConney back and forth. Um, the, the counterbalance of like, you had the physical skill when you were like at your prime, but then you said like, there was something about like the pressure that like didn't work for you. And now you come back to the tour and it feels like you're still good, but it feels like your mentality well, is so much better. So in the, in the beginning, nobody ever, well, I don't know whatever anybody else thought, but I certainly never thought that I would be out there. I didn't think I'd be out there for three years. I just wanted to try it. But, you know, I was winning as many as 30 events a year and I still barely made $10,000. So never in my life did I think, oh yeah, this is a great career idea. So then you come back on tour and it seems like you're just like beaming to like be back out here and like you've had some great performances. Like, you, I think you've like, Obviously you're a world champion, you're Hall of Famer, but like, you know, you come out here like in your 50s and you're still like podium finishing. Like, are you surprising yourself or yes. did you always know that you could do that? <laughs> no, I, I do surprise myself at times. <laughs> that sounds funny. Um, my, my worst enemy is the negativity that I have in my head. And I'm not alone in that. A lot of, I think even more women than men end up with that issue yeah and you know i i did experience a little of that towards the end of my first time around and i was so embarrassed by it and i tried everything i could to hide it from the world and now i actually think that i'm hopefully helping the field by saying yep <laughs> i'm scared <laughs> it sometimes doesn't work out and it's okay yeah <laughs> Well, now you're doing more commentary and like people have been really loving what you've been doing. How, how has that been? Like you, you've gone through this journey of like transitioning and you've mentioned like eventually you would love to do almost all commentary and a lot less, you know, disc golf. Ha has that grown to be an enjoyable experience for you too? Well, I think that it will. <laughs> I wouldn't say that it's there yet because I still am very self-critical and speaking is not my best <laughs> trait. Um, so I, I, I can see a time in which it becomes very enjoyable. Right now it's still work and anxiety. You're preaching to the choir right now. I like, <laughs> I, like, I went through stretches of, of my brief tour where I wouldn't feel a thing going up to T1 cause I was so burnt out. But whenever I did commentary, no matter what, it was like, huh, three, two, one, oh my gosh. <laughs> and it's like, I, I don't know when that's ever going to end. But I don't know, it kind of makes you feel alive a little bit. Yeah, yeah. No, I, don't, I actually almost feel more connected now doing commentary than I do playing. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> Beautiful. I think it's because... As terrible as this is, when I'm out playing, I don't fully believe that I can be at the top anymore. You've had like two or three podiums this year, right? Still doesn't matter. It, I, 
I still feel like it's kind of like a farewell tour. <laughs> okay. And that's not a good mindset to be in, to be aggressively competitive. Yeah. Are you going to be able to hang it up ever? Or are you going to play until your, your body just like stops wanting to play? Well, I'll play age protected until I can't, that's for sure. But I'm not going to be out here playing with the young girls if I can't, you know, if I'm back of the bus all the time, then, yeah. then no. Are I don't you, know how uh, much I'm going to play next year. It kind of depends on what commentary looks like. Yeah. I think, uh, I think it's funny, disc golf in general is year to year. You just never know what's going to happen these days. I'm kind of in the same boat. I guess I have one last question for you. Are you, are you proud of where things are now? Are you proud of what the sport in general, what the FPO division, what everything looks like right now? Absolutely. I, I'm amazed. I'm so proud of these young girls. I'm proud of the uh, organizations that have popped up to support it. I am so happy that we have gotten to where we have, in, not just in my lifetime, but in my active lifetime, so that I can not only see it, but experience it. Yeah. Coming up next on Catch, we head to the Queen City of Charlotte, North Carolina, where the man himself, Jeremy Colling, gives me a crash course on Charlotte disc golf history and a glimpse into his very unique flying disc collection. We'll see you then. So, so hang on. So there's a gap here that I don't understand. Yes. When did you get good at throwing traditional Frisbee? Like, did, did okay. Oakland start that? All right, so I let's go to the beginning then, Brian. 